Welcome back everyone. So I'm delighted to have Zeke Fox on the channel, the author of Number Go Up, which is a book that just came out two days ago and I kind of read it in a day and a half. It's, it's not a short book, but it is awfully entertaining. And so I spoke to him and asked him if he would come on the channel and talk to you guys. And so the uh, the book is basically, it, it's about crypto. It's about Sam Bankman Freed. It's, uh, you know, all of the stuff that you've probably been reading in the press over the last few years. But uh, the thing that's most entertaining is it's not just sort of a technical manual of kind of how things work in the world of crypto. It's much more of a kind of a social history of cryptocurrencies. It's telling you about kind of what went on and how it affected real people, how it uh, works, who the key players are, and so on. And so uh, here is Zeke Fox. Yes, I mean, like the last thing I would ever want to read or write was like some sort of long explanation of how blockchain worked. Um, this, you know, as you saw, like I pass over the technical stuff uh, as quickly as possible. And I've tried to tell the story of these last two years, which was, in my view, the greatest financial mania the world has ever seen. And for me as a reporter, I was like, had a front row seat. I was hanging out with these hustlers and zealots and con men when things were going great. And then I'm down, uh, you know, two years after at the end of two years down the rabbit hole, I'm at Sam Bankman Fried's penthouse in the Bahamas just before the cops show up. So, yeah, went into it not knowing that much about crypto, but it turned out to be like the greatest adventure that I think I'll ever go on. Well, there, there was even, I thought like the book, you know, not to give too much away about it, but there was almost a, a bit, you know, it kind of started out with a friend of yours. I think his name was Jay, who bought some Dogecoin, made a bit of money and went to Disneyland. And, you know, that's sort of the... Uh, the kind of fun end of uh, cryptocurrencies. But as we get towards the end of the book, it uh, it gets a lot darker. Yeah, like like you're saying, I, I'm, I'm hearing about a couple of years ago, like during the pandemic, I felt like everybody was talking about crypto. And my friend Jay was just one of the people that was texting me and saying like, oh, I'm making big money trading this or that. And yeah, he made enough on Dogecoin that uh, it helped him pay for this trip to Disney. He was teasing me about it. And I had like resisted all of, uh, uh, I'd resisted crypto as a topic for investigating. Like if you, if you know my work, I love investigating weird scams. So you would have thought that I would, crypto would be perfect for me, but I just, I didn't want to go there. Um, but it took a little bit of this FOMO for me to be like, you know what? I do want to know, why are these coins going up and up? Is there anything behind all of this? Like, what what is going on? Has the financial world just, like, gone insane? Yeah, no, it's it's so interesting. And, and you, you went rather deep into it. And one of the questions I was going to ask you is if you're still in touch with Dr. Scum. Oh, so Dr. Scum is my mutant ape. And that probably also just sounds like nonsense. So he's, uh, the Board Ape Yacht Club was a collection of NFTs. And these are basically like cartoons that you can buy for big amounts of money. And they had to do with crypto. So they got caught up in this crypto craze. And the Board Ape Yacht Club, it was 10,000 pictures of kind of interchangeable monkeys. And... Yeah, they're ugly pictures of monkeys wearing like silly hats. Justin Bieber bought one for like $2 million or something reportedly. And all the celebrities were getting them. And they're talking about this like it's like the future of art. And the crypto people would tease me that I couldn't possibly understand their world because I didn't own enough crypto. And I thought, you know what? Fine, maybe you're right. I got to try it out. But if I'm trying crypto out, I want to be part of like the best club. I'm not just going to buy three Dogecoins or whatever. I want a board ape. And so I sat my wife down after the kids were in bed. And I was like, Nikki, something's come up for the book. We got to talk. And she's like, okay, what is it? And I'm like, well, there's a big party coming up. I think it's going to be great material for the book. I got to see like what's going on for real when these guys get together. 
But to go to the party, Snoop's going to be there, Eminem, Jimmy Fallon, Amy Schumer. But if you want to get in, you need to have a board ape, and they're kind of expensive. Is it okay with you if I spend the book advance on a board ape? And she's like, uh, well, how much are they? And I'm like, well, what do you think? And she says, all right, like you sat me down here. They're clearly pretty expensive. Um, but you also said it's just like a JPEG image of an ape. So like, how much can they cost? And she's like, uh, I don't know, maybe five grand. And I told her the absolute cheapest one I can get to get into the party is going to be $40,000. And she just sort of looked at me like, like, disgusted, horrified. She was like, that could pay for a year of college. To be fair, by the time our kids get to college, like it's probably like a week of college, but set that aside. And I, but she, she quickly saw that this was a key part of the story. I needed that ape and she was going to support this. So I bought this mutant ape, which was a image of kind of the, the ones that are cheaper look kind of melted. I looked it up and it's it's a particularly ugly monkey. Like it's unusually ugly. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people said that to me, and I w- I thought it had sort of a cool look, but nobody agreed with me. And so, it by the time I bought it, the price had gone down to twenty thousand, which was cool because I didn't want to spend forty thousand, but it was also bad because it showed the price could go down fifty percent in like two weeks. Mm-hmm. So I uh, now. Everyone's talking about NFTs, like you got to join the community. It's so cool. And I was like, I'm going to go for it. So I even named my board AP was smoking a pipe. He had a sweater made of maggots. And I'm like, all right, his name is Dr. Scum. He's like a Sherlock Holmes type detective tormented by his maggoty sweater. But if he smokes weed in his pipe, it gives him super intelligence. And I went to the, uh, to the ape party with Dr. Scum uh, prepared to like join this club and talk about you know my new imaginary ape and to uh, meet other apes and like I don't know I wanted to see what what this crypto mania was all about. Well, it, it's uh, I guess one of the things I find interesting in sort of crypto and meme stocks, which are sort of things that happened at the same time, is there's sort of this this bizarre concept of community that you don't see in any other investment. Like if you own shares in, I don't know, like Abbott Labs or something like that, you don't join the community and get on Twitter spaces and talk about it all day long. Well, there's sort of a handful of stocks and crypto where you're sort of supposed to like basically Ponzi it up as much as you can. Well, that's what I learned when I got to ApeFest because I learned that financial investing in the same silly picture is not really like a very good basis for a community because I would be like, Hey guys, want to check out my Dr. Scum, my mutant ape. And they'd be like, some people would pretend to be interested, but I could tell they didn't care. And other kids, even like teenagers would be like, that ape is ugly. Mine costs a million dollars. You're a loser. And so, and there was, there was nothing to do with it. We didn't play games or anything. Everybody was just, uh, they didn't want to hear about the superpowers. Everybody was just sort of drunk and high, standing around. It was cool. Snoop performed an original song about how we should all buy ApeCoin, the (laughs) official currency of Bored Apes, and not Dogecoin. I was like, I I want to know how much you got paid for this, because that's like some serious shilling. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I was impressed they got him to do that. I, I, and I'm told he didn't even get paid, but maybe he owned some stock in like the company that yeah, makes the board. Yeah, told me that he has like ownership in Yuga Labs. Or I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I think that's the case. And so I, when I, I was almost relieved to learn that because I was like, I mean, I really like Snoop. He's like one of my favorite rappers. So I was like, he doesn't think this is cool, does he? And so it's almost a relief where it's like, oh, no, no, he's just like, you know, pumping his bags. Uh- it's funny. When I read the book, like the one thing I felt was that you didn't know much about rap music just because you were so dismissive about Russell Khan, who is my favorite rapper. Oh, yes. You know, I did give Razzle Khan a hard time in the book. This is if you guys somehow miss this story. 
Razzlecon is uh, her and her husband got arrested for the biggest heist of all time last year. They had stolen bitcoins from the crypto exchange, or they were accused of laundering the proceeds of the heist of bitcoins from this exchange, Bitfinex. By the time they got arrested, the bitcoins were worth like $4 billion. So it was like the biggest theft of anything ever. And while they were sitting on this pile of $4 billion, Heather Morgan, uh, one of the pair, had spent some of that money on some like pretty slick music videos. Um, and she had an alternate persona called Razzlecon. And she... I, I mean... She had sort of this like uh, catchphrase where she was almost like a cat, like coughing up a hairball. Um, and she was like really trying to be gross, but also trying to be sexy. Like she would say that she's like gross and sexy is my vibe. And like I uh, she would. And the weirdest thing was she was even rapping about things that seemed to relate to like being a hacker, which is like the last thing you would want to do when you're trying to get away with your four billion dollars in bitcoin it was kind of a funny thread throughout the book where many of the people you met with kind of they sort of they seem offended with the idea that people associate crypto with criminality but equally there were they kind of all insinuated uh possibly that they had some criminal backgrounds yeah well I'm glad you brought that up because crypto people, they always like to create this feeling that, you know, that we've weeded out the bad apples and the industry is about to go mainstream. Pretty soon, all the biggest players on Wall Street are going to invest. And there always is some like you're listening to this now. You're probably like, well, didn't I just read that like BlackRock's going to start an ETF? And it's like, yes, like there are some hedge funds or big firms on Wall Street creating that want to profit from investors desire to buy crypto. But like in terms of the bad apples, we just like keep reaching into the sack and finding more and more. Like this is just like a giant sack of rotten apples. And like, I, I, uh, I didn't even have to go that far down into the sack to find like a, a total scammer. Like one of the first people I met at the first crypto conference I went to was Alex Mashinsky. And he was like a super prominent person in crypto. He had this company, Celsius Network. And his pitch was that you could send him your coins, you'd earn 18% interest. And I was like, isn't that a little much? That seems like kind of implausible. And he was like, no, it's the banks that lie. They could pay 18% too. They just choose not to because they're greedy. I'm the good guy. I'll pay all the interest to you. And then uh, it turned out to be like a big scam. Company went bankrupt a few weeks ago. Mashinsky got arrested um, and just the crypto people want to like memory hole everything that happened in the last couple of years. Well, who, who would think that there'd be Ponzi uh, like economics to Ponzi like returns, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it was like uh, his business plan was just like laughable. And then um, we were sitting there and he's like, oh, I managed $20 billion. And I was just, I went back to my editor after that. It was like my first crypto conference. And I was just like, we could be writing about crypto for years. There's so much to dig into here. There's no time. We will not have time to investigate all of these companies before they blow up. Yeah, no, it, it is. It's nuts. Now, on the celebrity f side of it, one of the things I'm interested in your thoughts is, as you mentioned, like uh, kind of one of the big things with the Bored Ape thing was, you know, Paris Hilton and Jimmy Fallon in what sort of, uh, uh, you know, a TV appearance that looked to me like a breach of advertising standards. <laughs> but to what extent do you think, like, it, I feel that many of the celebrities or many of the people who pitch this stuff kind of knew that they were, they, they knew it was nonsense, but they were well paid to do so. Is, is that your feeling or, or do you think many of them bought into this? I mean... There, no one has been able to prove that these celebrities got free board apes or they got paid for it. Maybe some of them did have investments in Yuga or in MoonPay, 
which mm-hmm. was like connected with this whole thing. So they may have been sort of indirectly promoting companies that that they were involved with. But I also think a big part of it was that for certain people, crypto was actually kind of a cool thing to be associated with. Like they, for someone like Jimmy Fallon, he could change his profile picture to a bored ape. And maybe, I don't know, did he even go with a .eth Twitter name? Like, I think he might have. Um, And that's a way, yeah, that's a way to seem like you're with it. You know about the future of finance. Because I don't know what it is with celebrities these days, but they're not content to just be like famous entertainers. A lot of them also want to be like investment moguls. Mm. So, uh, in, so for some of these guys, I think crypto um, provided that veneer of like, uh, I'm a smart investor, even if the whole time many people were just laughing at it and didn't think this was a good idea at all. Amusingly, on on Twitter about a year ago, I thought it would be funny to crop my profile picture into a hexagon to make it look like a a fake NFT, which I thought was funny. But it was a bit like Dr. Scum, you know, where the the people who knew about it looked at it and went, that's a fake NFT. And the people who didn't know about it just thought I was a moron. Yeah. I mean, that it was so annoying. Like, I think it was my mom... I sent her because I tried to like get into it. So I was like, hey, mom, look at my cool new NFT that I bought my Dr. Scum, my mutant ape. And then she just sent me back the picture and was like, it's mine now. You know, I've got it on my phone. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, listen, mom, for very important and complicated blockchain reasons, you will never own Dr. Scum. But like, uh, it's going to take me like about an hour to explain why you don't own him. And she's like, no, it's good. You have fun at your eight party and please don't lose $20,000. She was probably more scared than me that I was going to lose the $20,000. Well, the the other funny part of that story was that your ape didn't actually get you into the ape party, right? Yes. Um, It turns out, even though NFTs are promoted as sort of like potentially a good solution for ticketing, the way it worked at ApeFest is you had to use some separate program to prove your ownership of the ape. And then you were issued like a unique QR code or maybe something on a special app. And you had to do that ahead of time. You couldn't just show up and, and uh, show your ape and get in. And the other thing is that as soon as I got the ape, everyone starts warning me they're going to get stolen. And I could Google it. I could see this is true. It does happen. And there, there was even a rumor going around that there was a QR code in Times Square for like a dating app where like hot women wanted to date people who owned bored apes. Should have been a clue. This was not legit. Um, but uh, the rumor was that if you, I can't remember if this ever was verified or not, but like the rumor was if you scanned this billboard, you would not meet any hot women. It would steal your bored ape. So while your ape didn't get stolen, you didn't necessarily find it very easy to to either buy it or sell it. Yeah. So this part of the process, I did not think would be particularly interesting, but it actually did prove very educational to buy some crypto, just like the guys who teased me had said it would, but not in the way that they had hoped. Because I had to get, in order to, most people who trade crypto probably just send some money to Coinbase or Robinhood or whatever. And as far as they're concerned, it's very similar experience to E-Trade or Mm. Schwab or your stock trading app. But to get an NFT, you really need to get your money into this decentralized crypto world. Like You have to use crypto for real. You have to download uh, a crypto wallet. And that's something, the one I used is called MetaMask. And... That's like a really popular crypto app that I heard about a lot. And I thought it was going to be all super high tech and cool. But what it boiled down to is that essentially, like if you're looking at your browser window and maybe some of you guys listening to this will be like, I know MetaMask is cool, but like for a newbie, it's super intimidating because they're like, your money is going to live right next to the URL in your browser in this like icon of a cartoon fox. And if you like type anything wrong or you lose your password, the money's gone. 
And they even make you watch an instructional video when you download the wallet. And the video suggests that you should engrave your password on a metal plate and bury it in your backyard. And I'm like, I don't have time for that. Come on. Um, Bank of America even called me when I was trying to wire my money to the crypto exchange. And they were like, Zeke, we think that you may be getting scammed. And I was like, wow. I, I, know, I, I have a whole new appreciation for the traditional financial system. I'm like, thank you. What You had a real person call me to warn me that I'm getting scammed. And I was like, friendly customer service agent, yes, I am getting scammed. Please put the wire through. I want to. <laughs> Willingly so. <laughs> yes. I'm going to pay $20,000 for a picture of a monkey. Put it through. <laughs> well, really for a link to a picture of a monkey, as your mom pointed out. <laughs> yes. And one. so as soon as I had... All right. There are so many problems with this. First of all, MetaMask does not automatically show that you own a picture of a monkey. You have to like tell it. So once I paid the 20 grand... To me, a lot of money, there was no, I was just like, it's gone. What happened? I thought I'd screwed it up, but you have to like hit reload six times and like hit control C or something. And then the, it shows that you own the picture of the monkey. And people are like, you can't keep the picture of the monkey on your phone. It'll get stolen. You need to put it on like a USB drive. And I'm, I'm weighing the possibilities and I'm like, what are the odds that the pro during the process of transferring my monkey to the USB drive, I'll lose it. I mean, it's not yeah. zero. I don't know how to do that. And then you have to bury it in your backyard as well, right? <laughs> I went for a middle ground. I don't actually know if this works, but I was like, I think it will be harder to hack my computer if I turn it off. So I was just like, the computer with, and I'm not even sure if the monkey was really on the computer, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure the monkey's on the computer now because I own it. It's not on my phone, I don't think. Turn off the computer and this will defeat most hackers. I, untested theory, but I was just like, don't. But then I kept wanting to use the computer for different things. And it made me very worried. Like if I browsed to the wrong website, my monkey would just disappear. Um, as soon as I got it, I just couldn't wait to like unload this monkey. Well, there's sort of this promise of, of crypto from the early days where people would tell you that you're avoiding the costs of the traditional financial system and they act like you know you can just that, that it's totally reasonable to go and pay for a coffee in bitcoin and they leave out that it costs you 50 bucks to buy and sell a bitcoin you know or to do a transaction yeah i'm sure the bitcoin people are listening to this and they're like patrick and zeke don't you know that if you download like the lightning wallet yeah. version 37, you could send the Bitcoins with like only six sets of transaction fees. And to that, mm -hmm. I would say, I traveled all the way around the world to report this book. Everywhere I went, I just tapped with my Visa card. I got no transaction fees. If I know the merchant pays, but that's, I don't yeah. see that. And I actually got rewards points. They didn't uh, charge, I don't get charged currency conversion fees. And so, like, that's what you're competing with. Yeah. Bury, bury the password in the backyard or Visa card that works everywhere. And if someone scams you, they'll give you a refund. Well, I actually have my Visa number engraved on a piece of metal and buried in my backyard. But that, I'm just <laughs> you know. but, um, but obviously, when you went to El Salvador, suddenly it flipped and your Visa was useless and and your your uh, crypto wallet was uh, you could pay for everything with an ape, right? Oh yes, yes. I was uh, no uh, even El Salvador. So if, if you're watching this, you're not familiar. It was like the first country that adopted Bitcoin, and the president made this big announcement that the whole country would use Bitcoin. Now the the currency of El Salvador is already the dollar, and they were sort of like now we have a second currency, Bitcoin. And all merchants, everyone in El Salvador was given $30 in Bitcoin if they downloaded this Bitcoin wallet app. And every merchant, every store was told they should accept Bitcoin. And Bitcoiners like hailed this as a, the first step into Bitcoin's global dominance. And they'd talk about it like it was this huge success story. So I flew down there, I wanted to try it out for myself. And this... There's a town that's sort of the center of the Bitcoin movement in El Salvador called El Zante. The Bitcoiners have 
renamed it Bitcoin Beach. It's not very considerate because the people of El Salvador, people speak Spanish, not English, but whatever. Um, first store I go to in Bitcoin Beach, I'm, it's a bodega. I, I take a bottle of water. I say, you know, can I have a bottle of water? I speak a little Spanish, but not very well. And I'm talking to the clerk and I'm like, puedo pagar con Bitcoin? And the guy just like looks at me and he's like, basura, which means trash. He grabs the water from my hand and like walks away. Like essentially like get out of my store, you jerk. I don't want to deal with your stupid Bitcoins. And like I did find some people who would take Bitcoin, but it was basically just like, I, I write in the book, it's sort of like, if you went to France and you were at a fancy restaurant and you asked them for ketchup, they might be like, fine. Like the stupid American wants some ketchup and they'd like go in the back room and find a dusty bottle of ketchup. They'd give you the ketchup, but they're not going to like it. They're not happy about it. The, yeah. the people that did like that would, they'd make all sorts of excuses. I'd be like, can I pay with Bitcoin? And they're like, Oh, like the Bitcoin manager is not here today. Are you sure you don't have any real money? And <laughs> uh, it was just like, it was actually hard to report on because it was so not a thing. Just like yeah. nobody cared about Bitcoin. They had bigger problems to worry about, like a huge crackdown on a uh, controversial crackdown on gangs by the president that rounded up 2% of all adults in the country and put them in prison. Um, so people just, they didn't even have much to say about Bitcoin other than thanks for the free 30 bucks. You know, I got my cousin who knows how to use my phone better. He managed to get the 30 bucks out of there somehow. And then I forgot about it. That was like yeah. the typical answer. Uh, but P- Bitcoiners and the president, President Bukele, still talk about it like it's this huge uh, success story. And pretty soon other countries are going to do it too. No, it's funny. About a week ago, I met a bunch of people who were claiming that they lived their life using uh, crypto, you know, that everything they buy and so on. And I said, can we go and get a coffee right now using crypto? And they're kind of like, well, I've got a credit card that links to crypto. It's like, okay. Uh, 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 yeah. Well, I got to tell you, like, even at like the Bitcoin conference, I don't want to say every single time, but the majority of the time, like the snack bar won't take Bitcoin. Like they'll be like, or it'll, the line will start to get too long. And they're like, look, can you guys please just, you know, do credit card tap to pay now? Um, you have to be like, it is possible to live your life in crypto if you're committed to that. Like if you really want to, you can do it. But if you, if crypto is going to take over the world, they need to provide an attractive alternative that's going to convince normal people to use it. And that the, the book's called Number Go Up because I think that's what a lot of the appeal of crypto boiled down to. Like why did other people use MetaMask and buy these bored apes. It was because they thought they would get rich. If you think you're going to get rich, it's all worth it. But if you don't think you're going to get rich, even if you don't think you're going to lose your money, if it's just like a break-even proposition, then why bother with all this stuff? Yeah, it's, uh, it's unusually fussy and sort of solves a problem that very few people have, other than this concept that you might get rich. Yeah, or... Like, if you don't want to pay your taxes, I still think, you know, that then I don't know that that would work. But like, once you start getting into stuff like getting rich or like hiding your money, you might be willing to put more effort into it. Um, mm-hmm. But for me, for like normies, you need to give us like a use case that we're going to find uh, that we're going to find appealing. And I, I also there's a lot of talk that like. Crypto could help the unbanked and people like poor people around the world who don't have access to bank accounts and i would say like if these like yes let's help these people join a financial system but let's not give them some like second class product like a coin whose value goes up and down all the time and that's really hard to use and you got to bury the password in the backyard like let's figure out a way to get them into the mainstream financial system that's going to help make their financial lives like easier. A, a question I was wondering your thoughts on are, there, there's sort of a whole bunch of people in this crypto space, but there's 
a big group of kind of VCs, like there's kind of our, our celebrity, I don't know, like Silicon Valley tech people, like there's Jack Dorsey, there's sort of the all in podcast guys, there's Sequoia. Do you think these people actually believe in it or are they, once again, it's just sort of a, a, a pump and dump scheme for them? That's a really good question. I mean, I mean, I think there's different groups here. We're like, Jack Dorsey is a billionaire. He could just go live on the beach with like the latest model that he's dating. Um, he doesn't really need Bitcoin, but he mm. seems really committed to it. He'll show up at these Bitcoin conferences. And he even did this program near my house in Brooklyn where he and Jay-Z partnered to give away some a small amount of Bitcoin and teach the residents of this uh, public housing project about Bitcoin. Yeah, the, um, the Bitcoin Academy, I think it was called. Yeah. And it's like, it just, it's so misguided. It's kind of offensive that like what these poor people need is to learn about Bitcoin. Um, this idea that Bitcoin is going to change the lives of the poor is like really bizarre wishful thinking so for him i don't know what to make of him he baffles me um for mm -hmm. the venture capitalists i think uh i don't i wouldn't use pump and dump is a strong word so i don't know if i'd go that far but i feel like uh they would say when they invest in one of these new crypto companies they have to be thinking about not is this going to take over the world but like are we able to invest at a low price and will the price rise in the future and so mm -hmm. like in the in the story i talk about one in the book i talk about one venture-backed company called uh they produced a game called axie infinity yeah and it was this was like a darling of this crypto world like the it was like the the hailed as like the big example of web3 and what it was was that you like bought a team of monsters it's a it was a game, a phone game, and you had it was like monsters battled. It's sort of like Pokemon, and you but you had to pay your for your monsters. They were like NFTs, and then if you played the game, you earned smooth love potions, which was like a proprietary cryptocurrency, and like it's kind of immediately apparent that, I mean. They were hailing this as like a replacement for work. They're like, this could be a new job for the for poor people. They just play this game all day after they buy their monsters. And yeah. like, it's one of those ideas that's like so transparently dumb that it's I don't even know where to where to start. It's like, no, that how can how can you base an economy on people paying playing a video game? You know, <laughs> like that that isn't even considered to be a good video game. <laughs> Right. Like, but these guys had big funding from venture capital because uh, this really took off. The price of smooth love potions started climbing and it became like this crazy bubble that sucked in like hundreds of thousands of people in the Philippines. And the, if you looked at like the user growth chart, it was crazy. You know, it was like spreading like wildfire. So they're able to raise big money from venture capital. But like, of course, the value of smooth love potions could not go up forever. And there was like a huge crash. Um, there, I went to the Philippines to talk to people. I talked, my cab driver had borrowed, I think like a thousand bucks from his in-laws to buy his team of monsters, you know, lost it all. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it turned, it was like a big problem for a lot of these people's lives. Like it sounds silly, like a silly game, but people had like really, they, if they became convinced this was like their way out of poverty, they listened to the pitch, they, they bought it, and they, uh, some of them just ended up wasting a lot of time, but others ended up like in debt and, you know, were really upset about it. And the people who created the game, the venture capitalists who backed it, um, you know, they haven't said sorry, they haven't been like, you know, we learned our lesson, we're gonna, we're gonna do things differently next time. Um, and this is like the most funny part, really like uh, rubbing salt in the wound. The Axie Infinity associated exchange called Ronin got hacked. The hackers got $600 million worth of crypto. 
And it's since been revealed by U.S. authorities that this money was stolen by North Korea and used to fund its weapons program. So, mm-hmm. like, the pitch was like Axie Infinity is going to help poor people. It's going to be like the future of the internet. We're all going to play to earn. And then the reality is like trail of devastation in the Philippines, $600 million for Kim Jong Un. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, I, I don't know. I couldn't believe it. Um, but I, I'm curious, what were the venture capitalist returns on that in the end? Like people in yeah. the Philippines, like they lost big, but how do I, how how did Andreessen Horowitz make out? And yeah, yeah. Um, but but even what was their idea getting in? Because to a certain extent, you know, there's some people who are rather financially unsophisticated, and you know, I can see them falling. For, you know, it's interesting because even I dug into some stuff. You know, people would tell me, "Oh, you have to learn about DeFi," and I I got you know I got this book uh, on DeFi which was supposed to be good, and you read up on it. And you quickly see, like, there's a big, there's sort of obvious flaws at the heart of many of these sort of what they like to call everything a technology, you know, like actually, you're the, you know, the, the, uh, in your book, there was a mention of someone referring to number go up as a technology. And it's like, not everything is a technology. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, in the DeFi thing, I found that there's one claim that it would make. Uh, you know, do away with middlemen and there'd be no transaction costs. But then equally, if you invested in the protocol, you'd make a ton of money. And it's like, well, I can only make a ton of money if there's transaction costs. Like it can't work both ways. Uh, yeah, that that is a really good point. Um, and I think like a lot of these ones, it boiled down to they were essentially paying early users to adopt they're incentivizing early users to adopt, like whatever, to start using a game or a protocol or whatever. But they didn't really have any long-term plan for how to turn these early users into profit. And I yeah. feel like, like in the long run, people would a lot of people crypto guy, guys would counter with, you know, isn't everything kind of rigged? Isn't like the stock market a scam too? And like, a lot of bad stuff happens on the stock market, but. Like if you buy a share of Apple, that represents yeah, a, claim on of a, t- a tiny fraction of uh, Apple's earnings in the future. Like they're going to yeah. make iPhones, they're going to make money, and you will get some of that money. You know, mm-hmm. that's like a it, if you buy one Solana token. I mean, I mean, I think you're. Does that even do you even have a claim on like the earnings of the Solana network? Like, and you're also, uh, uh, what is this network being used for? I don't know. Maybe Solana is not the best example, but just like you're saying, um, these, these protocols need to have some plan for earning money if they're really going to be valuable. And yeah, yeah. It, and with, with the board ape, when I went to go sell it, um, there was a plan for earning money there. I ended up spending like a thousand bucks, I think in fees, uh, yeah. on the round trip trade, but that's not very appealing either. No, no, it's you, you. You wouldn't want to be paying for your weekly groceries using using this stuff. But now, at the heart of your book, uh, it, there was sort of an interesting story in that, in a way, you were searching. You know, your your big interest was kind of in Tether and in the sort of people that are involved in in Tether. Um, but you ended up sort of meeting all sorts of other people, like, as you said, Michinsky and Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, and you were, I guess, almost so focused on, on the, you know, the scam that Tether looked like that uh, that, that Sam Bankman-Fried sort of slipped in under the radar. Definitely. Like, Tether's a long one to explain, but there was said at the start of the book there was kind of this mystery tether's supposed to be it's a crypto that's backed by real money and the company said they had something like 50 billion dollars and they were keeping it somewhere and that if any if everybody wanted to redeem their tether tokens they could trade them back for this for real money and i was like where is this 50 billion dollars they wouldn't say exactly and that's kind of trying to find it is what sent me down this path and got me sucked in um 
And I write in the book that Tether appeared to be like practically quilted out of red flags. Like the, the boss of the company, technically the CFO, is Giancarlo Di Vecini. He's, uh, he's from Milan. His early life, he was a plastic surgeon. Then he'd gone into like computer import, export. He'd been sued for counterfeiting by Microsoft. And he never gave any interviews. And the mm. CEO also no interviews and was seen in public so little that some people speculated he didn't really exist. Mm. Um, the company had been sued for fraud by New York Attorney General and accused of lying about its reserves. So I and it, but this company was really important in crypto. Everybody used it, and I was trying to figure out: Do they have all this money? And also, why does everyone trust them when there seems to be a lot of reasons to? be a little skeptical. And I went to, and that was like the link that brought me to meet all these people from Mashinsky who had, uh, his company had borrowed money from Tether or Sam Bankman fried was one of the biggest users of Tether. Mm -hmm. It was a big way that users could transfer real money to FTX, his exchange. Uh, which was in Hong Kong and then the Bahamas. Um, so I, I, it was like, it was a perfect way for me to get into this crypto world. And, but I never yeah. would have predicted that by the end, looking into what Tether was being used for took me to Cambodia, where I found that uh, like Chinese gangsters were using crypto to run internet scams. Yeah. Yeah, but b basically sort of, uh, you know, modern slavery all being paid for with, uh, with Tether, right? So, yeah, it's truly wild. There's like, if you ever get one of those weird text messages that's like, hey, Bill, did you get the milk for the cat today? Um, this person is probably trying to entice you into some sort of crypto scam. Like if you start talking to them, eventually they'll say they're a great trader and you should send, you should go on Coinbase or crypto.com, buy some tethers, send them over and we're going to make big money. And then, Amusingly, those people populate the comment section of YouTube videos as well. Like it's sort of the, the bane of my existence. I, I have oh, software oh. to try and delete these comments because... Every time someone says great video, someone, a fake version of me underneath says, message me on Signal at this number and, and I'll tell you about my crypto scheme, you know? Yeah. So just so, for my viewers, I never message you on Signal about my crypto schemes. <laughs> um, well, so the big twist is that the people who do send these messages are often themselves victims of human trafficking. They're like from Vietnam or Thailand or across China. They're across Southeast Asia. They've been they've seen ads for like high paying customer service jobs. They travel to Cambodia or Myanmar. Once they're there, they are not allowed to leave. And I went to Sihanoukville in southwestern Cambodia, where there's whole office parks, like giant towers, floor after floor of people, and all of them working around the clock sending these spam messages and trying to scam people. Mm. And I spoke with people who had escaped from these scam compounds. Yeah, because it sounded quite violent, right? Like, I mean, people were being uh, tortured and beaten. There, were there armed guards, did you say? Armed, there's armed guards. There's, uh, I mean, people were sending me gruesome photos of their injuries. And it was actually one of my best sources about this who connected helped me find some of the escapees was a popular vietnamese youtuber named fong bui and he had kind of made it his thing for a while where you could the only way out of these compounds was to pay a ransom and mm. he would pay the ransoms and he was rescuing people uh and then he would make videos about where he'd interview them about what they'd seen inside yeah um and he, truly like gruesome just like they've got the guards all have these electric shock batons um they'll make the the workers beat each other if they don't hit their scam quotas uh and there's all sorts of reports of uh suspicious deaths and i mean you can find all sorts of videos of horrible things going on 
in these compounds. Now, now the thing is, crypto people would tell you that all of this stuff could be paid for with the U.S. dollar. Like the the the, the fact that there's crimes going on is unrelated to crypto. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and uh, look, I'm sure the crimes would go on, but what I would say is that, like, I spoke with a veteran police officer from Taiwan who had traveled to Cambodia to rescue like young women from Taiwan who had been trapped in some of these scam compounds. And he was like, these gangsters are buying and selling people like from one compound to another for tether. And like, yes, human trafficking is an old, and there's no allegation that like tether the company, you know, is like involved in this. They've just created this currency that bad people are using. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, as you point out in your book, they refuse to undo certain, they, they'll undo transactions when there's a scam against one of their buddies, like a, another crypto company, but they won't do a, undo a transaction if you can show them that it relates to some gruesome crime like this. Yeah, like if they get an order from law enforcement, like they're probably, they're going to follow it, right? But these victims, it's like a complex transnational crime. It's very hard for them to even like educate law enforcement about what Tether is and where their money might be. And this this police officer from Taiwan, he was like, yes, the hum I've investigated human trafficking for a long time. The criminals, when they use banks, at least like you have to put a name down when you open your account. Like that was something to go on. If yeah. these gangsters are using Tether, I got nothing. There's no name associated with the account. I can't call Tether and get any information. Tether itself would not, because uh, Tether is held in a, you can hold it in a decentralized wallet, just like I did with Dr. Scum um, in MetaMask. And there's, no one is asking for my identity. Um, yeah. And uh, so he said it made my job a lot harder. And also like, I played along with one of these scammers and sent some tethers in. Um, yeah, because you were able to track that it related to the specific compound, right? That, like you, um, I, I didn't. I didn't quite get that far. I wish I had. Um, but what I was going to say is that, like, if I use my Visa card to pay the scammers, um, I, you know, I could charge it back. Their merchant account would be eventually. Visa would shut down their merchant account because they'd be getting too many complaints. And like, sure, yeah. they could probably try and get a new one, but like, I think this is uh, like supercharging these scams. This is actually a great use case for crypto. It's making it a lot easier for, um, it's making it a lot easier for these scammers to do their business. And one thing that absolutely does not prove anything, but I found very telling was that I traveled, by the time I got to Cambodia, I traveled the world for a long time. I really hadn't seen much usage of crypto in the real world, but I'm on the bus from Ho Chi Minh City, across the border in a town called Bavet, which is notoriously the home of like many of these scam compounds. And I, I go to the parking lot of a place where I'd seen videos of like workers escaping from this casino. And right in the parking lot, there's a little booth for like a money transfer, a little money transfer booth. And they're adver they have Tether's logo on it. They're advertising like change your dollars here. For tether and i'm like this is certainly an interesting coincidence that this is the first time i've seen I'm pretty much sure i think that's the first time i saw tether's logo anywhere in the real world now tell me this because on the sam bankman free thing like what did you think when you met him did you kind of get a funny vibe from him like did you think he was smart did you think he like what what were your thoughts because you spent a couple of days kind of sitting next to him at his desk right yeah. So in February 2022, right after FTX aired a Super Bowl ad with Larry David, um, when he was sort of the boy genius of crypto, one of the richest men in the world, I flew down to the Bahamas to meet him. And he was seemingly like very, very open. He was just like, yeah, pull up a chair, sit with me, watch me do my thing. And like, what... Some things he did were pretty odd. Like one of the things he did in front of me was he was giving like a virtual talk to 
the Economic Club of New York, which is like a very important group where like presidents give talks. Yeah. But like Sam Bankman Fried is giving this talk and he's got the talk open on one screen. And on the other screen, he's playing a video game. He's like, uh, uh, you know, he's like, oh, my, he's typing in here, like his character name. He's got like a little, a team of like fairy tale creatures and he's battling people, you know, like he doesn't even care about this talk. And meanwhile, also, he doesn't care that the reporter is here watching him give the talk and play the video game. Like, he wants me to see that. Like, he thinks that's... Uh, do you think it's funny that sort of famously the partners at Sequoia were quite impressed that when he presented to, to them that he was playing a video game. Like, to you, did it come off as like a, a genius multitasker or just like a dopey kid who doesn't, you know, who can't focus on things? Um, I have to say, I felt like he told... I didn't really blame him. I felt like he told the same stories like a million times and that mm -hmm. he was probably kind of bored of like telling the story of how he started FTX and that, uh, uh, so he was going to play video games while, while he gave the talk. So I, I did think it was kind of interestingly disrespectful that he would allow me to see him play video games while he gave the talk and like, knowing that I would write about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was funny. Like the Sequoia uh, investors, when they learned that, that he'd done it, they were just like, wow, like this kid, he doesn't care. He's trying to raise billions. So he cares so little. He'll play video games while he does it. Like let's give him $10 billion or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like they loved it. Yeah. So, and I, I, I was probably thinking, Hey, like this is good material for my story. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's, uh, the other thing, I, uh, you know, Michael Lewis, um, whose book is coming out shortly, um, that I think many people are looking forward to. He shows up in your book and was surprisingly, at least, uh, came off to you as quite a believer in all of this. Like you, you expected maybe some skepticism because he has a history of working in the financial industry, but he it appears kind of fell for it hook, line, and sinker. So, yeah, this was a few months later. I went back to the Bahamas for this big conference host put on by FTX, Sam's company, and meant to celebrate Sam's success. And he was interviewed, Sam was interviewed on stage by Michael Lewis, which from the beginning I thought was a little odd. Like as an independent reporter, I would not want to appear at a corporate conference because that would give like the impression that I was endorsing that company, whatever I said. Right. Mm. Um, but then um, and I don't want to claim like I called it. I thought Sam Bankman Fried was a fraud all along. I didn't think that. I thought that he was running kind of like an offshore crypto casino where people could go trade all these random coins that a lot of people would probably lose money trading the coins. I did not think that he would gamble away all the money that had been entrusted to, to FTX. Yeah. Um, so I just want to get that out of the way. But Michael Lewis is on stage. He's interviewing Sam. And he says right at the beginning, like, he's just talking him up. He's like, wow, you're like, you made, you were like a billionaire. You're, you're breaking land speed records. And like you're going to he's acting like Sam's going to revolutionize Wall Street. And Michael Lewis says, you know, I don't know very much about crypto, but then he's talking about it like crypto is the future. And like you said, it's going to eliminate these middlemen and it's going to he's acting like Sam is one of his, you know, the heroes of one of his books, like one of these rebels who's going to like fight the system and uh, mm -hmm. be a hero. And I I. Uh, so this is my first book, right? Michael Lewis is like the king of business books. Yeah, so yeah. I'm obviously like, I'm, I'm like, oh man, this is it's a little scary that he's going to be writing a book about the same topic as me. Uh, yeah. But when he gave the speech, I was like, maybe he's not writing a book. Like if he was writing a book about this guy, would he really be on stage saying all these great things about him? Wouldn't he yeah, want yeah. to like act a little bit more 
independent. Um, but I, I also want to say that now that I've, uh, yeah, his book isn't out yet. I haven't read it. Um, but I'm no longer that worried about it. I'm this crypto adventure was like, this was like the adventure that I've been waiting for my whole life. It was like the book that I've been, I realized it's a book I've wanted to write, like since I was like a teenager, my, and I think it's like a really crazy ride. And I'm only, my worry now is just that like, this will never be matched. How am I going to find something else to write about? Like, what's my next book going to be about? Um, there, there's always something new though, right? Because there, there's always new stuff happening. So. I don't, I just, I don't know if it's going to top, uh, you know, the Sam Bakeman freed the, and uh, this cast of characters from Tether. I don't know. I'm a bit, um, I'm sure something will come up. Thank you. And, and you were also, you were there in the house with him when, uh, like after things went wrong, right? Like you almost attended meetings amongst him and his staff when, uh, you know, when he was about to be arrested, right? There was this period where Sam was holed up in his penthouse in the Bahamas. FTX has collapsed. It sure looked like something terrible had happened. Some sort of fraud had been committed, but Sam had not been arrested yet. No charges had been filed. And I, Sam had been giving some weird interviews to random interviews online. And what he was saying just didn't really make, he'd said like stuff on Twitter that didn't really make sense. And I'm thinking to myself, look, I'm pretty sure I know what happened, but I want to hear what he's got to say. Like, does he have some, can he, what is his version of the story? Hmm. Where did all the customer's money go? And so I, I waited up, he keeps odd hours. So I waited up till, you know, one or two in the morning and I sent him a message asking if uh, he's a big, like he's got this trader mentality, right? Everything's sort of like a bet. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask him, did you, so in, in, in that, in that trader world, right? Like, let's say I think it, that um, it's a good bet that the Red Sox will win tomorrow. That's my mm -hmm. favorite baseball team. And I bet on the Red Sox because I'm convinced they're like the odds are wrong and like it's a good bet. The odds, the actual odds of winning are higher. So and yeah. then let's say the Red Sox go out and lose tomorrow. That does not make it a bad bet. That just means I got on like the fact that it didn't work out does not. Yeah, the probability and the outcome are different things. Yeah. Yes. So I, that's what I asked Sam. I was like, did you make a mistake? I mean, I'm being polite, so I'm not like, did you defraud everyone? I'm like, did you <laughs> did you make a mistake, or did you make a good bet that just and you the the outcome was not what you hoped for, you know? And like, I that he found this to be, I was like, he was like, I well, it's not as black and white as it seems. I might be willing to talk with you. So I'm like, all right, that sounds pretty good. I'm off to the Bahamas. So I flew down to the Bahamas, and after. I really didn't know what to expect, but after a couple of days, he did agree to let me uh, come speak to him. And I wasn't sure, like, would he be totally despondent? Would he be, like, in tears? Would he be, like, would he be all alone? Um, but he greeted me at, in the lobby of his uh, condo building, which is in this, like, crazy resort in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And he, he was the same as ever. He, like, shuffled out there in his crew socks, his uniform of, like, you know, khaki shorts and a FTX t-shirt. And he's just like, you know, it's been kind of like a weird week, huh? And, <laughs> uh, you know, like maybe he's keeping on a brave face, but to me, it seemed like he was kind of delusional. And he really thought that at the time he was really trying to raise money. And if he could find someone to give him like five or $10 billion. Then he'd only be down three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, we spent like hours and hours talking about what had happened to this money, where it went. But in the end, I just, I just, uh, uh, I didn't find his version of the story very convincing. And now, 
four of his top lieutenants have all pleaded guilty and said, like, yes, like, we committed crimes. We knew it was wrong. And several of them are, I believe, planning to testify against Sam when his trial comes up. Well, even the the story you told, there was sort of one one guy who was sort of appeared to have stuck with him. But then when you asked the guy questions, the guy, it was all self-interest. Like the guy in no way, he wasn't sort of like, well, Sam was good to me. I'm sticking with him. I will find out that he's innocent. The guy's kind of like, oh, you know, there's some upside in this for me. It, this was like in a book of jaw-dropping moments. I was just like, I didn't know what to say when this happened. Uh, so Sam had to go do something during our interview. And I had said like, listen, I'm, I have some questions about what you're saying. I don't really believe it. Do you have anyone else who could like speak for you? Who's like on your side? And he was like, all right, you got to meet this other guy. My, one of my few remaining supporters. And I had not prepared. I didn't know I was going to meet this guy. I didn't really have good questions prepared. I like to start with easy questions anyway. And so I'm just sort of asking him like, so why do you support Sam? Stuff like that. And he said, I, I firmly believe that like in the United States, once you hit a certain level of wealth, like you'll always be rich and like, you'll never go to jail. And I'm like, that, uh, what you're supposed you've been brought in here to endorse sam what are you talking about i'm picturing him uh you know test of i'm picturing like congress holding hearings and they're like reading this quote out loud and like this is the worst thing you could say yeah (laughs) and then um so then i'm like all right he needs an easier question like he's not good at interviews um so i'm like what makes you like i i think i even like let him into it i'm like what makes you think that sam is honest and He's like, whoa, I didn't say he was honest. <laughs> and then like, uh, I, yeah, I'm just like, I don't even know what to do now. I'm starting to feel kind of bad. Okay, this is kind of weird thing about me. Like, on some level, I don't really like to win. Like, if I'm like playing tennis or something, if I start to like win too much, I start to feel bad. That Not that I would because I'm bad at sports. But if I ever would, if I ever do, I start to feel bad that I'm going to, like, beat the other person and that they will be sad about it. Well, you don't want to be Kramer in the karate lessons, you know? Like, (laughs) if it's too easy, you feel bad about winning. Yeah. So, like, in this interview, I'm just, like, uh, after he said those things, I'm just, like, oh, I'm not, like, I'm just feeling bad that for this guy that he's so bad at doing interviews. Um, It was just... uh, and I'm feeling bad for Sam that, like, this is the best he's got in terms of... Uh, like, you wanted to give the guy a break, tell him, could you go away and think and come back and say something less dumb? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm not that nice. I should have... I, I should have... Uh, I should have done that if I wanted to be really... <laughs> I, well, I also... It's my job, right? I'm not supposed to, like, coach people. I'm supposed to let them yeah. say stuff and, like, write it down, you know? Yeah. And I, so I can't... It's not my fault that what he said was very, very dumb. You know, yeah. uh, that's what I have to tell myself. <laughs> well, you'd, you'd like to have, uh, have tricked it out of him rather than have him just spill it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It felt like it's like not very, uh, it's not very sporting, you know. Yeah, it didn't demand much skill from you as an interviewer. <laughs> so what are your long-term thoughts on this? Like, obviously... You know, I, I think a lot of the world has maybe lost interest, but there's still many devotees. In fact, I, I unfortunately had to meet with someone about a week ago who was wearing a Bored Ape t-shirt. He had had the ape that he owns painted on a t-shirt. And I sort of felt like, if it, to me, I sort of felt it's a bit like turning up in a dunce cap, but I guess maybe <laughs> everything else was in the laundry. Um, but, you know, there are still these devotees, and uh, and then I feel that a lot of the rest of the world sort of feels that it is a, a system filled with, I don't know, like, how can I describe it? The It's sort of been pitched as a trustless system that seems to uh, attract the most untrustworthy people in the world. And there's a point at which you think, like, maybe I don't want to transact with these people, but... Where do you see this going? Like, what's your long-term vision of, like, what will happen with crypto? So, 
I, I was pleased because the other day, Amazon made number go up in editor's pick and they put it in the history section. And I'm mm. like, this is appropriate. This is like, yeah, as I think you said at the beginning, this is like a social history of this insane period of the last couple of years. We're never going to see anything like this again. Um, and I do, I, I don't think like everything's going to go to zero tomorrow. Like clearly a lot of people are still interested in crypto. A lot of smart people are trying to come up with some sort of new thing that's going to get the rest of us to get back involved. But uh, I think anybody who's pitched on a crypto thing in the future is going to think to themselves, isn't there like a chance that this one could be a scam? Cause like, from mm. what I remember, a lot of the other ones were scams. Yeah. And like, why is it going to be worth their time to like, we're already talked about how the user experience is very bad. Then you yeah. have the chance, you have the chance that the one you picked is a scam, which like, how do you, how do you know that it isn't? Is you know, that's a lot of yeah. that. And that, is it worth also, my time even finding out whether it is or isn't? Right. Yeah. It, like in the book, um, I talk about um, the bullshit asymmetry principle, which is yep. like this idea that this Italian programmer came up with. And he says that the amount of energy needed to disprove bullshit is an order of magnitude greater than the amount of energy needed to create it. Mm. And it's like, uh, yeah, so people say these crypto things, they say, I've oh, got this great new crypto company. And if like I, as a potential, as an investigative reporter, I'm like, it's going to take me a long time to figure out whether this one is good or not. The last couple ones I looked into were not good. Mm. You know, why, why bother? Like, um, it, I think... Um, that said, you know, the, I think in the past, what appealed to people was like these numbers going up and up. And I'm sure we haven't seen the last like hot crypto coin. I'm sure there'll be like some other one that gets that gets the people going. Um, but yeah, 48... It slightly entertains me that, you know, there's sort of this discussion as to whether the SEC or who should regulate crypto. And I would largely argue that it's just sort of as you say, it's a bit of a number goes up, like people just sort of betting on a thing. I would argue that the Las Vegas Gaming Commission should regulate crypto. <laughs> Does that make sense? Or? Uh, I mean, yes, I use the casino metaphor a lot. And I think it, I think that's fair. Um, and, you know, you brought up the apes. And one thing yeah. I do want to investigate is like, you know, a year ago... I'm I'm estimating here, but maybe the good apes went for like 500 grand or something like that. And now they're down like 90%. But that yeah. still means that somebody is paying 50 grand for the link to the image of the ape, even after everything. So I like, who are these people that are buying in now that I yeah. think that I want to, I guess I got to go back to ape fest if I want to, if I want to find out. At some point, does it become like dot com memorabilia? Like I have kicking around somewhere here. Um, I have my uh, my my pets dot com sock puppet, you know. And I kind of wonder, like, eventually, will someone like me buy an ape in order just <laughs> to have a joke, you know? Well, you know, yeah. Or, but you know what? Wouldn't it be a better joke if uh, just print it on a t shirt? You don't even have to buy it. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, one thing I with the I love the apes as a just like it's they're fascinating to me, and it reminded me of because um, partly their value is based on this perception that like they're cool or they will be cool in the future, mm -hmm. and I think that like one thing that people really overlook is that things just don't stay cool forever. Yeah, well, like Beanie Babies, you know, Beanie Babies were meant to go up and up and up, and there was this story of rarity. But rarity, you know, there's I think there's a, an idea that confuses a lot of people. There's lots of things that are rare that are not valuable. Like, you know, your fingerprints, they're rare. Best of luck selling them. You know, my my daughter's paintings, you know, I love them, but they're, and they're rare. But for some pe reason, people won't pay what they'll pay for a Picasso for, for a kid's drawing. And rarity isn't really enough. Yes. I, I spent a long time um, working on 
uh, thinking about this one, because they like to say there's only 21 million Bitcoins, thus they must be valuable in the future. So I was trying to research, like, what is something else that there's only 21 million of so that we could, for this purpose of having this discussion. And I found that 21 million copies of Toy Story were created on VHS. And, yeah. like, presumably, like, the VHS factory is destroyed. No yeah, more VHSs of Toy Story. Ones. Yeah. And-, and there's a good chance that a lot of them have been lost as well, much like the Bitcoin. Yes, but... Go on eBay, get one of those for like five bucks, you know? Is that your uh, advice is probably to hoard DVDs or, or sorry, VHS is a toy story? Yes. I Like as a reporter, I don't usually like to give financial advice, but I would say that the Bitcoin toy story VHS parody um, ratio is off. And yeah, like it's time to stockpile those Toy Story VHS is because the world's going to wake up one day. They're going to realize there's a limited supply. No more will ever be created and the value will inevitably rise. And it's possibly reasonable that we base a future monetary system on them. When I am elected president, Toy Story VHSs will be legal tender. I've actually heard there's a South American country that's considering that already, but don't, <laughs> we're, we're going to keep quiet about that. Well, I'm going to just wrap up by, I have to recommend this book. Um, it's it's a, a fairly thick book. It's very entertaining. I read it in sort of two days because I was enjoying it so much. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's already, I think, a bit of a hit after two days. As you said, it's like a top pick on Amazon. And so I'll put a link to it in my video description and hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, my viewers will enjoy it as much as I did. Well, thank you so much for reading it. And I really enjoyed talking with you about crypto. Okay, well, thank you guys for joining for uh, this chat with Zeke. I'm sure you guys found him as entertaining as I do. And, uh, you know, do check this book out. I'll put a link uh, to it in the video description below if, uh, you know, if you're interested in picking up a copy. And I would really recommend it. It's one of the most entertaining books, uh, you know, finance type books I've read in quite a while. So uh, check out the link in the description. And if you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.